and the holiday armadillo. What? These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. Hey, it's David Jaffe, the co-creator of Twisted Metal and the game director, lead designer of the very first God of War. I hope you're well. I want to let you know you are watching the reviews. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and we're gathered here today to talk about your favorite TV show, Friends. Friends is one of the most iconic series in all of television history. Whether you love it or you hate it, you can't deny the impact that it's had. I mean, 20 years after it's been off the air, it's still mostly fondly remembered. It clearly did something right. However, it also did a bunch of things wrong. Or, at the very least, questionable. And today, we're here to take a look back at some of the less fondly remembered moments of the show. Now let's start off with what I believe is the biggest cardinal sin in, in any TV show or series. Clip shows. Don't get me wrong, I get it. Clip shows are a great way to recap moments from seasons past, remind viewers of some of the funnier or more fond moments of said series, provide a good starting point for newer viewers, all while requiring less work to do and less money to spend. I get it. I do. I understand the, the thought process in them. And hell, I'll even say sometimes they really work. But even if your show has been running for a decade, in my estimation, you were afforded two clip show episodes without them coming across as an annoying crutch and a cash saver. Friends had six of them. Yeah, six. As a matter of fact, starting in season six, there was a clip show once a season. And by the way, almost never, almost never did it seem necessary. These trips down memory lane hardly ever served a narrative and didn't really strum viewers' heartstrings. They just, they just rubbed them the wrong way. We've seen all this before. Why are we watching this again? When re-watching the show, I always skip these episodes. They're not even good for white noise when you're working on something and you just want to have something on in the background. There are some shows out there that can perfectly utilize guest stars, playing to their strengths while banking off of their star power. Friends was not one of those shows. They have some of the most blatant misuses of talent I have ever seen. They had scary movie star Anna Faris show up for an entire plot being the surrogate for Monica and Chandler, and she really didn't do much of anything. Why would you hire a funny woman to, to not do anything funny? I, I don't understand. Sean Penn showed up as Ursula's sensitive boyfriend who winds up falling for Phoebe. And again, he didn't really do much of anything. David Arquette played Ursula Stalker, who winds up falling for Phoebe, and wait, wait a second, did I bring this up already? Why on a rider came in for an episode to be Rachel's first girl kiss? That was... That... Happened? They once had John claude Van Damme show up to make a Van Damme ass of himself. You know what, uh, unless you're gonna have the guy throw a bunch of worked kicks and punches, I'm gonna go ahead and say there's no reason to cast him. Ben Stiller played Rachel's one-time date who had a serious impulse control problem. That's all there was to it. And that's just with me skipping over Bruce Willis and Alex Baldwin's brief time on the show. Then they had Robin Williams for a scene. I don't, I don't, I don't fucking know. The show also had a serious continuity problem, which could probably be attributed to being written on an episodic basis. Outside of major storylines, the goal with Friends was just about putting together a good episode, even if that meant stepping on the toes of previous episodes. Take, for example, the fact that Chandler and Rachel meet four separate times. They're introduced to each other in the pilot. Except that they already made out in college, and Chandler tried to hit on her during his goatee-having days. Then there's the fact that the characters' birthdays and ages seem to change at random during the course of the series. Or, most importantly, Ross not liking ice cream. But then why is he eating ice cream in this scene right here? Something that always irked me was the show's depiction of LGBTQ characters. And yes, guys, I know, here, here's the part, because I said those magical letters, all of a sudden, you're gonna use some letters of your own. Oh, 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 SJW, SJW. Why don't, you, why don't you hear me the fuck out first, for a second, all right? Twitter fingers, calm down. I can accept and even laugh at the Chandler's gay jokes. Honestly, I can. I mean, it feels like they relied too heavily on them at times. Sure. And at some point in time, it just becomes like, guys, come, come on, I get it, but like, let's... Do we have any other jokes? But then again, that could be said about a lot of Friends jokes. They knew what already worked, and maybe over time they depended a little bit too much on what did. I mean, why risk it and explore new territories when the old ones are already there and still seem to hold up at the time? But the depiction of Carol and Susan on Friends 
was maybe in poor taste. Maybe. Carol is Ross's ex-wife, who eventually discovers that she was playing for the wrong team. But luckily, she finds Susan, who apparently has a jersey that fits. Carol breaks things off with Ross to pursue a relationship with Susan. And let me just say now, man, fuck Susan. Susan was the worst human being ever envisioned in sitcom history. So her and Carol begin dating, but like, she just seems to rub her relationship in Ross's face every chance she gets, whether it's justified or not. She completely mocks, humiliates, and even dehumanizes him. When it's revealed that Carol is actually pregnant with Ross's child, she attempts to nudge him out of the picture entirely and treats him like a sperm donor to his own child, attempting to take over his parental role. Look, I'm not saying that just because you make a character gay do they have to be the most wonderful human being who has ever lived, because by no means do I think that. Who you love has no bearing over what type of human being you are. But looking back in hindsight, I think this might have played up on the man-hating, woman-loving, lesbian stereotype just a bit too much. I mean, Susan is genuinely a completely unlikable character. And I just loathed her to her very core every time she showed up on my screen. To be fair, they did have a mini redemption arc where her and Ross made peace with each other and she treated him nicely. But I, I don't know, man. The damage was already done to this character. There was no making things better here. Too little, too late. There were other iffy storylines too, like Phoebe's brother Frank Jr. getting into a relationship with his teacher. Although that is not the first time such a storyline would play on this show. More on that later. But Frank was actively in a relationship with a woman 26 years his senior. Ugh. I mean, to each their own, but... No, no, wait, no, I stand by what I said. Ugh. Kitty Foreman, this is... This is not what I would expect from you. And if I'm being honest, that's not even the weirdest part of their story. But again, more on that later. But outside of the annoyances I've already listed, let's move on to some of the stranger or just stupider, and yes, I did use that word, things that the show did with its cast. And speaking of stupid, let's start with Joey. In life, some people mature and develop and better themselves. You know, with age comes wisdom. Joey Tribbiani is not one of those people. The man progressively gets dumber as time goes on. Now, this man was never the brightest bulb in the shed. You know, he wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the lamp store. But this show really did a number on him. He started off as a normal human being who was maybe mildly dumb, but by the end of the show, he didn't understand air quotes and was finding his identical hand twin. The guy was mistakenly leaving children on buses and attempting to eat potpourri. Or hey, who could forget his failed attempts at learning French? The guy had a hard enough time with English. We're really trying to teach him a second language? Don't get me wrong, Joey becoming stupefied definitely did add its fair share of laughs to the show. Uh, most of these laughs coming from my father, who was in tears in the living room. But in some ways, I feel like it was kind of a fall from grace. I always liked Joey as being a little dumb. But like, you know, believably dumb. You know, there was almost a hair of unpredictability to him. You never knew what he did or didn't understand. But as the show was wrapping up, you could pretty much count on his stupidity. Still, it was far from the worst thing to happen on the show. Or even to Joey. There was also the time he pursued his roommate, which, you know, not really a good idea in real life for a variety of reasons. Like, let's say that she takes the bait and you guys date and then things don't work out. You still have to see each other every day and potentially hear your former significant other bone someone else in the other room right next to yours. You know, it's not smart. But then again, it's Joey we're talking about, so of course it wasn't smart. But aside from that, he falls for a woman who has all the personality of a piece of cardboard. I never really felt that she added much during her time on the show, but then they end her time in the season absolutely despising Joey's group of friends. I didn't find her or her arc entertaining, it just kind of felt like a waste of time. And if I wanted to waste my own time, I would go back and watch my own videos, thank you very much. But the absolute worst of Joey's story has to be when the show decided to pair him with Rachel. Rachel! Rachel! This was a story loathed by almost any and everybody who had ever tuned into the show. And yet, the writers kind of stood by it. Both Matt LeBlanc and Jennifer Aniston, Joey and Rachel's actors, begged the producers not to see the story through. But their complaints fell on deaf ears. And this story fell upon those who wished they had blind eyes. There was very little chemistry between the two outside of a standard friendship. And yet still, for two seasons there was a will they or won't they plot. Which really felt like a please don't, 
I hope they don't, story. Joey was good to Rachel, that much is undeniable. But still, the two just didn't mesh well outside of their friendship. The idea that there was a sudden romance between two people who had been close friends for over a decade seemed a little bit far-fetched. Like, I'm not suggesting that such a thing doesn't on occasion happen, but in the real world, that's rare. And in TV world, just it just didn't work. No one wanted to see Joey and Rachel, and they just didn't make for a compatible or, or hell, even a believable couple. Also, the fact that this was coming up in the midst of her pregnancy with Ross, one of Joey's best friends, made it that much stranger. Having Joey serve as a roadblock on the path to Ross and Rachel just felt really cheap and a complete misuse of the Joey character. And then you have him accidentally proposing to her and then not correcting that he wasn't actually proposing to her? I don't know, I guess I just could have gone without that entire storyline personally. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Phoebe, very similarly, was dumbed down over time. Just like Joey, Phoebe lost IQ points with each passing season. I could sit here and just copy and paste what I said about Joey here, but that would really just be a waste of time for all of us, so let's just pretend like I did anyway and move on from it. Because pretty much the same. But outside of that, there were plenty of other strange Phoebe Phoebeisms. There was the time her brother and girlfriend slash former teacher asked her to be the surrogate of their child. And she accepted. Yeah, that's right, Phoebe carried her brother's children. And if I wasn't worried about getting copyright stricken, I would play Sweet Home Alabama right now. I mean, is that not bizarre, to say the very least? Is that, is it just me? Is it just, I'll shut up if it's just me. One of the more strange stories for Phoebe was when she was under the impression that her dead mother's soul inhabited a cat. Yeah, that one, that one was a little bizarre. And the alleged story behind the story is that one of the writers had just lost their mother and pitched that idea. And nobody felt comfortable in saying no, so they just kind of let it play out. And if that's the case, and that was somehow creative venting, them going through their own mental therapy, then you know what, I'm just, I'll accept it and I'll move on. But the worst of the worst was having her end up with Mike. Now listen, I love Paul Rudd as much as the next guy. As a matter of fact, may maybe even more so. As it's a handsome man right there. And I am in no way, shape, or form uh, being nice to him because I'm hoping that he will take me to the fountain of the youth that he clearly has discovered and is keeping for himself. I just happen to be a fan of the guy's work. He he's a funny guy. Wonderful human being. Paul, my DMs are open, Paul. Anyway, like I was saying, I love Paul Rudd just as much as the next guy, but I just never saw the chemistry between the two. The fact that they intentionally brought back David, who seemed to be a much better match for Phoebe, and still had her choose the dude from Clueless over him kind of feels like a slap in the face to longtime fans. David appeared in the first season of the show, and their chemistry was very evident. Unfortunately, their love was cut short when he had to head to Minsk. Regardless, he made one hell of an impression on Phoebe and the audience watching. Alternatively, I think it's just as outrageous that the show never ran with the idea of pairing Joey and Phoebe together. More than Ross and Rachel, more than Monica and Chandler, it to me always seemed that Joey and Phoebe had much, much more in common. The two did legitimately have chemistry on screen, and almost seemed as the gender-swapped versions of each other. They plotted and schemed together on multiple occasions, and they did in fact seem interested in each other at different times to varying degrees. Hell, they even kissed a handful of times! And yet, the writers never pursued that. Matt LeBlanc and Lisa Kudrow, Joey and Phoebe's actors, had even gone to the writers to pitch a temporary plot between the two, but they were turned down. Ah yes, Joey and Phoebe? No one, no one wants any of that shit. But Joey and Rachel, now there's a story. As an angry video game nerd that I think we all know would say, what were they thinking? Hey, but speaking of Rachel, cause, cause we, we were for a second there, there was the time that she tried to win Joshua over by dressing up in her old high school cheerleading uniform and performing cheers. I mean, that was, that was, that was kind of painful. It's hard to watch that and not cringe. Actually, come to think of it, it's just hard to watch that in general. Her relationship with Joshua always seemed really, really forced to me. Like it bordered somewhere between uncomfortable and mediocre. Mediocre? And that may be because of the two actors who played those roles. Jennifer Aniston and Tate Donovan, Rachel and Joshua respectively, used to date. Actually, they had only just broken up not too long before Tate showed up on the show for the very first time. So what went on behind the camera? 
was clearly affecting what went on in front of it. Even as a kid watching the show, I always thought this pairing felt a little awkward, and it didn't seem intentional either. At least now it makes sense as to why. It's not easy working with your exes, trust me, I know. And I can only imagine it's that much harder when the wound is still fresh. But then again, Rachel was never really good at relationships anyway. Like the time she hired that bonehead because she wanted to bone him. There is a gap in age and a bigger gap in maturity. And the two weren't really all that compatible. But her borderline obsession with her employee was always a little bit strange. I mean, you do you, but did you have to do him? She just never really made any good choices in her love life, which of course, I can relate to. Chandler might have had it the best on the show. The jokes on him did get really old really quick, and that's fine, but there were also some harebrained ideas there. Making him move to Tulsa for work and putting a strain on his relationship with Monica was really questionable. I don't think anybody watching the show wanted to see a roadblock be put between these two. Much like the couple, the viewers just wanted them to enjoy their time together. The fact that he accidentally accepted the job because he fell asleep during a meeting was definitely a Chandler move. But still, uh, this story just wasn't it, Chief. Is that... Is, is that was that what the kids are saying? Did, did, I, did I use it right? A am I hip? Do you guys like me? There's other things that people complain about with Chandler, like him allegedly being transphobic of his father. But I don't think they're even using that word correctly because I'm pretty sure his dad was just a drag queen unless I'm missing something. Plus, that arc served its purpose. That storyline led to Chandler coming to accept his father for who he was, and eventually they reestablished a relationship. Woke culture needs to understand that there's a little thing called character development. If everyone's a picture-perfect person, there's no room for growth. And there's no real situations that they can learn from and improve on. But you know who had a substantially worse run of things? His wife, Monica. Like Chandler, who had the one running joke of, everyone thinks you're gay, Monica had the, hey, you used to be fat. I'm not saying you can't make jokes about things. I personally believe you should be able to make a joke about almost anything. And as long as it comes from a place of trying to entertain and not from a place of malice, in my eyes, you're fine. But in binge-watching these episodes, it just becomes really tired really quick. To be fair, the Friends producers could have no way of predicting the future and how we'd view their creation, so let's give them a pass on that. However, what I'm not willing to give them a pass on is starting Monica off as a normal human being with maybe a tinge of OCD, only to completely devolve her into a manic clean freak with the dark side. If Joey and Phoebe got dumber as time went on, Monica got more annoying. I don't think many people would disagree with me here. And if you do, then fucking show yourselves, cowards. I mean, there was a point in time where she was almost the voice of reason of the group. But by the end of it, she was just a reasonless voice that's always talking. She makes sure to tell and pretty much insist that Chandler use his life savings on their wedding. Like, not even a little of it. All of it. I get that a wedding is a woman's special day. But you want to have some happy days after it, don't you? You're gonna need that money. Then there's also these weird leaps in logic that she seems to take. Like randomly assuming that her new maid is stealing from her without any real proof or any reason to think that at all. Or thinking that Chandler was getting off to sharks because she walked in on him and he flipped the channel. Listen, I, I know it's called Jaws, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. There's a movie called I can assure you, it's not about what you may think it's about. She also once befriended the woman who stole her identity, and almost idolized her as a matter of fact, which, I don't know, just doesn't seem like something I would do personally. But then again, who, who, who would want to steal my identity? I don't even want to be me. Oh, and despite Courtney Cox being Courtney fucking Cox, wow, you know what, uh, I'm now realizing I probably could have worded the first half of that sentence a little bit better. Let me try again. And despite Courtney Cox being Courtney Cox, the show decided Monica had to be a sexual alien trying to use the art of seduction while sick as a dog, or while she's twirling around a knife, being unreasonably and uncontrollably turned on by Phoebe's massage, getting it on with Chandler when there's a baby present. I mean, come on, do you, do you even know how to do the sex? Then there's the big one from me, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of flack for this, because I, I, I don't hear it mentioned often, but her relationship with Richard. Richard was a much older man, and more importantly, was her father's best friend since they were younger. He watched her grow up. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was in the equation before she was in existence. And it's just, 
uh, that's just, uh, that's, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I think the reason that this is all glossed over is because Richard was played by Magnum P.I. himself, Tom Selleck, who is one of the most charming and charismatic men in any and all generations. I mean, the guy has an undeniable, likable quality to him, and he never once came off as a creep. I'm not even saying that he is, but this situation is creepy. Strangely enough, the two actors seem to have a lot of chemistry between them, so I think that's why audiences were able to forget the age factor and just completely ignore the entire backstory because of that. But still, I don't know, man. Just looking at this on paper, it's kind of weird. Equally weird is when Monica took the virginity of an underage kid. Yeah, that, that happened. So I guess that Monica just took the phrase age is just a number to heart. But now for the worst of the worst, Monica's brother, Ross. Now, a lot of people watching the show with modern eyes will tell you that Ross is awful. Now, I don't know that I entirely agree with that. Like, I don't know if Ross is toxic. I do, however, believe that he's idiotic. Ross had some of the absolute worst dog shit storylines in the entire series. So let's go through some of the more puzzling Ross decisions. Starting with, where are this man's children? He had a son, Ben, with his first wife, but he's rarely ever seen or spoken of. I mean, sure, I get it. They have split custody, and therefore, he's really a part-time parent. But the kid wasn't even there for part of the time. He would occasionally get brought up and factor into episodes until he didn't. Ben isn't seen at all in the show's final two seasons whatsoever. Maybe he's out somewhere hanging out with Judy Winslow. I, I don't know. Ben pretty much disappears entirely when Emma shows up. But that doesn't mean that Emma fares too much better either, as despite being the daughter of two of the main characters and the main pairing in the show, she's mostly an afterthought. Especially in the final season of the show. I mean, Rachel is literally about to move to Paris, and Ross has absolutely no objections to her taking the baby with her. Assuming that she is in fact going to take the baby. Ross... Do you know where your children are? But hey, let's forget that for a moment, because being a neglectful parent is the least of Ross's problems. Of course, there was him making a huge deal out of his son playing with a doll, and I never got that mentality personally. I don't want my son to turn out gay, so I'm only gonna let him play with boy action figures. Because everybody knows, uh, taking an interest in women, super gay. Then there's Ross being all up in arms that Rachel hired a male nanny for Emma. The whole episode, Ross is disgusted with just how sensitive the guy is. And look, I I'm not gonna lie. There's some funny jokes, and the setup almost works. You know, the dude isn't exactly your typical guy. But neither is Ross. He's a dinosaur-loving dweeb. He's not exactly oozing machismo himself. I just feel that the joke would work better if Ross met Sandy's sensitivity with utter confusion. But the way the episode is put together, it comes off more like absolute disgust with this man's mere existence. Let's talk about Ross's first kiss with Rachel, which, as it turns out, was actually his first kiss with Monica, his sister. Yeah, apparently back in high school, he made out with who he thought was Rachel in a dark room, and inadvertently gave his own sister her first kiss. Is he your stepbrother at least, or a adopted or something? No reply. So it's real. Oh my god. Yep. So glad we retconned that in. That's that's entirely necessary. That that's good. No, guys, I yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. But that's not all of Ross's relation relations. As he spends an episode contemplating making a move on his own cousin. His blood cousin, mind you. I mean, granted, his cousin was Denise Richards, but still, man, come on, what are you doing? I mean, yes, I am laughing, but that's only because I'm very, very uncomfortable and I don't know what else to do. When Ross isn't trying to knock down his own family tree, he's engaging in other questionable relationships, like the time he dated one of his students. A very young-looking student, mind you. Ross, what, what are you doing, man? I I'm trying to go to bat for you here, but you're not making it easier for me. I started off a sentence one way, and, and I'm kind of disproving my own point. Granted, this girl was clearly of age, being a college student and all, but it doesn't really take away from the creepy factor. And this seems to be a fact that the show is actually aware of. There's like a 12-year age difference between these two. What could you possibly have in common? Oh, well, at least we got to see a delirious, dancing Bruce Willis out of this whole ordeal. Safe to say, Ross was very unconventional when it came to his relationships. The only semi-normal-seeming relationship he found himself in was with Rachel. And that ended badly. Multiple times. When they were apart and seeing other people, Ross was shown to be severely jealous of her significant others. Which, 
all right, I guess you can't help how you feel. But even when they were together, he became insanely jealous of her co-worker, Mark, and sent her over-the-top extravagant gifts to mark his territory and prevent Mark from uh, marking his. Gifts including, but not limited to, a barber shop quartet. And I just gotta ask the generations that came before me, did that actually ever work? Like, like at any point in life, in society, did people enjoy these? Because I would like to know why, and when, and how. To be fair to Ross, yes, Mark was clearly trying to make a move on his girlfriend that she was blissfully unaware of. But man, there's better ways of going about this. Why do you always have to pick the creepiest option? Luckily, things work out for the two and they get married. Drunkenly in Vegas. They both decide it's a mistake, and Rachel trusts Ross to end their brief union. But instead of getting an annulment, he secretly remains married to her. Because at this point, he's already two divorces deep, and you know the old three strikes and you're out rule. They remain married incognito for six months, unbeknownst to Rachel. Which is, again, a little strange to say the least. But I think the weirdest thing between Ross and Rachel is that they were the series' end goal. Now look, I understand why in the beginning the writers would have set up the show like that. And hell, even from a storytelling standpoint, I understand why they'd end the show together. But like, were any of us really happy to see that? It just reminded me so much of the Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker relationship from the Sam Raimi movies. These two put each other through the ringer so many times, should they even really be together by the end? I think the writers played a little bit too much with the will they or won't they. Ross and Rachel did have some great chemistry and they were a cute pairing. About a little less than half a decade ago. But by the time the finale came around, it just felt boringly inevitable. I gotta say, it was kind of annoying that no matter how long the two were kept apart, they would just merge back together at random intervals when the writing demanded it. Maybe it's just me, and it could just be me. At some point, it felt like the chemistry had died out, and they had moved on as characters, despite the show constantly telling us that was not the case. Anyway, uh, case in point, Ross is a weird fucking dude. I actually was really fond of the Ross character as a kid, but I think that has a lot more to do with David Schwimmer's comedic timing and anti-charisma. The dude is so likable that he makes a bitter, bizarre, otherworldly creature like Ross seem entertaining. You almost want to root for him. Almost. And to me, that has been the worst of friends. Did I miss anything? I'm sure I did. Feel free to fill in the blanks in the comment section below, that is what it's there for. And with that being said, I'm V Infuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight, and that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.